Good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the organisers for the great hospitality and friendship they've shown to all, all of us in this event and, and for their great dedication to Gustav's work that uh, we all admire. Okay, I'm going to give you a purely personal account of working with Gustav in two particular projects. I was um, elected by the Students' Union at University College Swansea. Are we getting enough sound? No, can you speak closer to the mic? Is that enough? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one of my uh, intentions when I selected Swansea to study at was, uh, firstly, that it was, had a growing reputation for ecology, which I wanted to study, and secondly, that it had a students' union financed and run arts festival. And one of my objectives in my first year at the university was to build a caucus of support that would get me elected into that job, and I succeeded in that. So I had, I had missed DS because I took August of 66 to go to Paris to celebrate the end of my A-level exams and getting a university place. So I didn't see any of the information about DS. Uh, but when I got back to London, I found a, a great deal of information about it in this famous issue of Art and Artists magazine. And uh, a local shop uh, always kept me a copy of that every month, so that was there to show me what I'd missed. Uh, obviously, when I saw that I, and read the other stuff about Metzger, it seemed to me that he was by far the most radical and dynamic and leading artist working in London and probably in Europe and I wanted him at the centre of the festival that I was going to organise. So after I was elected then the question, it was like um, the game of fantasy football where adult men make up dream teams and pitch them against each other. Well my question was Metzger and who else? And it was an easy set of questions to answer. I found um, thinking thinking about it, the time scale I had to work in was preposterously short because the finance didn't get put together until the summer of sixty seven so I didn't get to start work on the festival that was to take place in January of 68, we actually started work on planning the festival in September the year 67. Ridiculous time scale. You, if you were doing something like that now, you would expect to have at least two years run in time for it. Nobody had explained that to me. I was like the bumblebee that nobody has explained to him the mathematical proof that he can't fly, so I just did it. And miraculously, it, it all worked. I found people to help me, and I was able to say to somebody, look, we've got a con concert of modern chamber music. I've never organised one before. Can you find out what's involved in organising one and do it? And we got there. So one of the people that I was able to speak to about Gustav's part of the festival was a professor William Gosling. He was the professor of chemical engineering and he was a prominent Quaker. He was therefore a pacifist and he was very impressed with what I had to tell him about Gustav's involvement with the Committee of 100 and the sit-down protests in Trafalgar Square and that made that impressed him a lot and that made it possible for him to offer the facilities that Gustav came to use in the filtration laboratory. I should also mention the help that I had from a man called Peter Jones in the Welsh Arts Council. He, he was brilliant. Um, he used to phone me privately and explain to me what I should say in applications for funding and basically explain to me all the buttons that needed to be pressed to get the Welsh Arts Council on our side. And again, miraculously, the funding was all approved and 
sent to us within a period of three months. I'm sure this, uh, this is very enviable to people who are trying to organise exhibitions in the current circumstances. Right, the original proposal for Gustav's contribution was to be two separate exhibitions. Um, there was a, to be an outdoor exhibition that nobody knows anything about now. I'm the last person uh, who remembers any of it, so I'm, I'm privileged to be able to download this memory and not, not to carry the burden of uniqueness any longer. I can, I can recall three pieces that were proposed for the outdoor exhibition. The first was, it consisted, consisted of a large steel girder. I think it would probably have been about 25 feet long. And on the end of it would be welded a, a large plain black steel ball of a weight that was calculated such that at some point during the week-long exhibition, the girder would collapse and break under the weight of the, the steel ball, which would come crashing down onto the ground below. So that was, that was the first one. The second one was a work very similar to five screens with computer, but it only consisted of two screens, one on each side of the square. And it would pump out fairly large blocks of transparent plastic uh, because for the, for the project to work it only had a week's life, life cycle so we had to get through ejecting the blocks fairly quickly compared to the years long plan for five screens. And the third piece that I can remember him discussing and proposing was to fill an arcade that joined two blocks of the engineering department uh, with inflated meteorological balloons. And these would be pumped up to their maximum and wedged into the arcade so nobody could get through it. And because they were pumped up to the max, when sunlight fell on them, they would overheat and explode. And over the course of the week, the, the work would disappear. Some of the balloons had, would, were going to have coloured dye in them so that when they exploded, they would throw uh, a cloud of colour in whatever direction the wind dictated and some others would have some small pieces of metal like nuts and bolts which so that they would uh, be thrown up into the air in the explosion and then fall down making a musical sound that uh, would become part of the memory of the work in the minds of anybody who happened to be there at the random moment when the balloons exploded. Well, we tried very hard to get these proposals past the university bureaucrats, but predictably we didn't. Um, I would say Gustav displayed a, um, a remarkable lack of diplomacy in the, those discussions. Um, all, all the things that he wanted to emphasise were the things that I wanted to play down. <coughs> Uh, for example, uh, on the, the steel ball idea, um, the um, university's premises manager said, um, well, won't it cause a lot of damage to the pavings when it comes crashing down? And Gustav said, yes, it will. It will be beautiful. <laughs> um, which is not the way I would have gone about selling the idea. So that exhibition you now know as much as anybody in the world does about it because I've uh, performed a memory dump and no longer have the burden of carrying that all by myself. Let me come on to the filtration laboratory experiments. This was really was an extraordinary environment for Gustav to be able to work in. It had obviously gas, water and electricity, but it had compressed air piped throughout it with numerous outlets and as I recall there were three different levels of pressure that could be tapped into uh, as well as an atomized water spray extremely fine mist that could be projected of extremely pure chemically pure water I 
somebody did once explain to me the purposes that chemical engineers wanted it for, but I can't remember. So one of the first things that he set up was the hot plates. I think there were three hot plates, and they were of a very high specification, extremely pure surfaces polished to as high a level as the engineers could achieve. And, and that was important because in, in ruling out random effects from impurities on the surface, it gave him a great deal of control over the water droplets that were tapped onto the hot plates. And he uh, was achieving some extraordinary results with that. By controlling the temperature of the hot plate and the pressure of the water and the speed of the water, he could, for example, make pure spherical droplets that would bounce around without disintegrating. So if you, if you would use the standard culinary hot plate and ordinary water, you would very quickly get a deposit of calcium carbonate that would then stop any of these effects that Gustav was working with. Then <coughs> he went on to produce effects like the cymatics of Hans Jenny that uh, he was very interested in. I remember he had uh, a photocopy of an article from Studio International explaining the cymatics. And what he could do was <coughs> to feed water slowly onto the surface of the hot plate, expanding it until he could make a disc about that kind of distance across. And that would begin to behave in <coughs> quite unexpected ways. This disc would begin to produce tendrils in different orders of symmetry, sometimes 10, sometimes 12, sometimes even as many as 14. And he could control those effects. He could make them predictable by the very precise metering and control that he had. And then... We, we actually discovered that they could be made to move. They would rotate, sometimes clockwise, sometimes anti-clockwise. And he was still trying to study what settings would cause those effects. And some of the uh, lubrication engineers from the uh, chemical engineering department came in and looked at that, and they, they were totally amazed. They said, we, we don't even have a vocabulary to describe these effects. You have made a, a totally new scientific discovery. We don't know whether it can conceivably be applied anywhere, but it is a new area to be studied, and we will study it, which I understand that they did. There were other works in the filtration lab. There was a corner that was used for the liquid crystal displays and technicians in the engineer engineering departments rigged up a system for Gustav with a, um, a cyclic program to heat the slides up and then cool them so that the image changed over the course of time and they gave, gave him some uh, good quality lecture, lecturers projectors rather than the uh, the little junk shop projector that he brought with him. So there was a lot of support that we, that we got from the scientists and engineers who were very interested in the things that were going on. One other piece uh, that I can remember him using was he had some glass vats, I should think about this, this kind of size, uh, with a very, very dense silica gel. It was transparent, uh, and he was sculpting in that with the pipes of compressed air. He would sort of force jets of compressed air down into it, and they would they would bubble up and make a, an increasingly complicated shapes he, as he developed his ability to work on it. And I'll show you in a moment. There are three images have survived of, of that particular work. They are the first three there on the um, on the contact sheet. Um, others, other pieces included um, 
the levitation of sheets of expanded polystyrene and other plastics, again using <coughs> uh, carefully controlled jets of compressed air. And the most complex work that he did involved the atomized water sprays and compressed air in combination. And uh, I will show you what we can see of the surviving images of that work. It was documented in considerable detail. Um, Alan Brooks, who was the senior photographer in metallurgy, spent a lot of time both filming and on stills. And all of that material was sent to Gustav. But uh, I understand he, he said to somebody that it had all been lost or destroyed. Now, when I was speaking to Alan just before Christmas, uh, he agreed to make one further search of his archives to see if anything at all had survived. And he found this one contact sheet at the, at the bottom of a box devoted to a completely different project. And as far as we can tell, this is the only documentation that survives of Extreme's touch. I think maybe before going on to say a few words about the International Coalition, if we go through these slides. This one, neither Alan nor I know what it is, but it survives and so we think uh, it ought to be preserved. Now here is the first of three images of the silica gel. And this was at quite an early stage of the work before Gustav developed stronger techniques with jets of compressed air at con controlled angles at and at different pressures. But you can see how it makes quite interesting flexible textures. It's a bit like the, um, the liquid crystal display, but in, in three dimensions. So we have three images of those pieces. And then the, the work with the crystal, uh, sorry, with the um, atomized water sprays was as you can gather, an extremely difficult thing to, to photograph. But you, you can get some Im impression of the kind of things that Gustav was able to do by combining finely directed compressed air into atomized water. And he could achieve standing waves and a, a number of different forms of movement and circulation of the mist. He also discovered about halfway through that by also carefully placing spotlights he could create rainbows in any part of the laboratory and he could actually display the, the full circle of a, a, a tiny rainbow just, just above the door. And as Alan Brooks said at the, at the time, that was fucking good art. <laughs> and, and nobody could disagree with that. So we have, I think, about a dozen images of the atomized water. And this, this um, contact sheet really needs some, uh, some loving care and attention because it's... Uh, survived some 40 odd years at the, at the bottom of a box file where it didn't belong. It's gathered a, a lot of dust and some scratches. Uh, but I was speaking earlier to Soren, who uh, I think has volunteered that his photo archive will endeavor to rescue as, as much as can be rescued from, from this document. So you can see all the um, all the pipe work that was available to create these effects in different parts of the room. And you, only, you can only really get a very sketchy idea of what it, what it was like from these, but they are the only images that, that have survived. <laughs> So I hope that gives you a little flavour of what the filtration lab was like and what was, what was achieved there. In my view, 
uh, Gustav got closer to his ideal of material transforming art in, in that exhibition than he was able to do anywhere else. And it was a great privilege to have been able to take, take part and assist and facilitate it. Okay, after university, we had the, I, I was involved with Gustav in the International Coalition for the Liquidation of Art, a grand resounding title for a small group of people in London. We had some contact with the Art Workers Coalition in the USA and the BBK in Holland. Uh, but it was significantly independent of those. Gustav drafted a manifesto, I think jointly with John Latham, uh, which was published in the press. Um, I do have a, I've, I have a copy with some extracts of it here. Oh, I should say, one, the reason why I'm, this presentation is so disorganised is, firstly, I'd written twice as much as I had time for about the filtration lab, and... I'd been searching desperately for a diary I kept at the time of the International Coalition, and it wasn't until 10 o'clock on Wednesday night that I finally found it. My wife and I were getting desperate, and we said, there's just one part of the study that we haven't gone through, and there was about 300 weight of boxes and crates to be moved before we could get to those files. And then I went, went through all the pocket files on that shelf, and um, finally at 10 o'clock, <laughs> I found it. So I noticed, I didn't remember a lot of it, so it's, it's really valuable. I noted that I had started writing a note on the history of the International Coalition. I got almost to the end of the first page of it. Um, but I've got notes here of the different meetings that were going on the ICLA was really only a part of a, a whole complex of artists' movements towards radical political positions at that time. And Gustav and John Latham were not very motivated to extend their influence among art students who were carrying out similar activity. Um, but we did meet them. Once we called the demonstration on the steps of the Tate Gallery, we met uh, the people that would make, make up the nucleus of a meeting in November at the Slade School of Art, where the movement was to be formally incorporated and launched. One of, one of those was a man called Bruce Birchall, who was a well-known organiser of community theatre and, and sort of guerrilla theatre events. And to, together we worked on the disruption of a Royal Academy exhibition called Young Contemporaries. About 50 of us uh, attended to, on the grounds that we were going to be performing an event. But uh, actually we managed to disrupt the, the whole evening and uh, caused, caused a minor scandal. The um, there was a major difficulty in that November meeting. And it's quite sad to remember it. Really, we had Bruce Birchall in particular had won the support of a man called Jim Allen that some of you may know of or may not. Jim Allen was a political playwright of very high quality. He'd had a number of things broadcast on television, and he came to collaborate with Ken Loach on a number of his films. He was a hardline Trotskyist. He belonged to the Socialist Labour League that subsequently became the Workers' Revolutionary Party. So he had very clear, pronounced, and not always correct political positions. I thought it was a great achievement that we'd won him to come to our launch meeting and to get his contributions. Gustav was not present during the morning session at which Jim spoke. And when 
Gustav did arrive, the first thing he did was to pick up and put in his pocket the list of names and addresses that people had contributed. And Jim Allen responded to that in a typically paranoid SLL manner, saying, this man must be a police spy, he's come to take all our names and addresses and report us to the authorities. During the lunch break, there, there was some reason for, for Jim to have possibly thought that, because we spent our lunch break disrupting uh, the lunch of Harold Wilson, the former Prime Minister, uh, who was making a, a totally hypocritical speech about the war on want to a, a panel of millionaires in the next building. And the police had treated a couple of the disruptors of that in a particularly aggressive manner, so you can see why Jim's political paranoia was heightened. Um, but he fell out very seriously. There was a very serious and bitter argument between Gustav and Jim. Um, Gustav called him a psychopath and a fascist, both of which were radically wrong estimates of the man. Um, and Jim left, never, never to return, and not to be involved with this again, which I found to be a great loss because I thought he was at least contributing a political clarity and direction that we didn't have at that stage. So I've got notes then of a, a series of meetings that took place around the ICLA and it was in about the middle of November that we decided to drop the name. It had been useful as a, a, pro, um, a provocation and a, a, so, a source of uh, stimulating argument and interest. Uh, but it wasn't really a fair reflection of... <coughs> the approach is being taken by the people who were actually involved in it. Um, apart from myself, um, Felipe Ehrenberg, uh, Ian Breakwell was involved around the edges of it, but he was working outside London at the time, uh, and a number of others. I will type up this diary and present it to the Metzger Foundation for their archive and anybody else who wants it. Well, I'm sure I've overrun my 10 minutes now, so I think um, it's probably appropriate for me to shut up. And uh, <laughs> I, I would say, oh, just finally, in the, my 1970 festival, uh, we produced this tabloid format, and Gustav was extremely helpful in providing contacts for that. And the introductory statement that's signed by me, you really ought to think of as a joint statement between me and Gustav. Um, I understand from Mathieu that uh, he paid £100 to get a copy of this. <laughs> well, anticipating that, I brought a second <laughs> copy. <laughs> uh, I'm not asking anybody for £100, but I will sort of auction it. Whoever offers me the most can have it. <laughs> and and the, proce the proceeds will go to whatever charity for the homeless in... Den Hog, I can find before I go home tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.